Well, good evening. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 18. We're going to see Paul going to Corinth. So I'm so glad you joined us tonight, and we are going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will jump into the chapter of Acts 18. Father, we thank you again for another time that we can be together to study your word, God. And Father, we know that you have carefully written all of this down in order that we may learn and know about what you are doing in the world to bring lost souls to, unto yourself. So, Father, I pray that as we go through this study that we will see your hand in everything that has taken place, God, and the diligence of the people involved in order to make sure that the gospel goes forth. And I pray that we will have that same diligence in our heart and mind. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our church and in, in our lives as individuals and in our nation. And we pray, God, for a great revival. And we pray, Lord God, for your healing upon this land. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, well, everybody, if you'll get your Bibles, we're going to go to Acts chapter 18. But before we do that, let's do a little bit of a review. Now, well, let's look back at chapter 17 for just a minute. As you recall, we're on the second missionary journey. And uh, so uh, to tonight, we're actually going to finish up the second missionary journey. But last week, we were right in the middle of it. And uh, so I want you to look at that uh, map right there. And where I'm going to pick up where chapter 17 picked up was, if you recall, last week was in Thessalonica. And um, do you remember what we learned about Thessalonica? That they were accused of turning the world upside down. What a great epithet to be said of us. And we looked at when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, well, exactly how did how did that happen? How did Paul do that? And and it was just living a faithful witness for God. It, we read in 1 Thessalonians that he was willing to suffer for the gospel. We read that he spoke the truth, the word of God boldly, knowing that he had been entrusted with the gospel. He sought to please God and not man, and he was gentle among them like a mother with her children, cherishing each one, and he labored like a brother and as in order to provide for his means so that he could share the gospel. And then he conducted himself blamelessly and justly in all things, and he exhorted them to, like a father does his own children to have a walk worthy of the gospel of God. Well, from Thessalonica, as you recall, uh, he was only there about three Sabbaths, and then he ended up being run out of town, and so at night, he then takes this secondary road and goes down to Berea, and you recall that. And at Berea, we loved to see how they were so eager to receive the Word of God, and they searched the Scriptures daily in order to see if what Paul was saying was true. And so we learned from that, well, then the Jews from Thessalonica showed up. So Paul is, is basically run out of town again, and he now goes down to Athens. And as you can see, uh, it's a little ambiguous as far as whether did he walk it completely or did he was part of it uh, taken by sea. Not sure, but he ends up in Athens, and uh, we learned there how to share the gospel with those who know nothing about God. And we were in a very philosophical town and where it says that people stood in the marketplace during the day just to hear something new and just to debate and to talk. And so we see the gospel and the Jesus and the resurrection introduced right there where Paul then is invited to go down to the Areopagus and to give a, a speech that we talked about last week. And um, so anyway, but a, a, as we now close out the Macedonian province, prov province that, that, that Roman province that he was in, I want you to just think with me just for a minute because I wanted to make sure um, that you understood this point last week was that when he had that Macedonia vision and he goes over and he goes to Philippi and as you recall he gets thrown into prison there and then he goes down to Thessalonica and he has run out of town there and he then goes down to Berea same thing happens there and so he's only able to stay a few weeks in any of these places and it would be tempting that to say well was this a successful ministry but we must remember that the success in God's eyes is spelled 
faithful. And Paul was faithful. He was faithful to preach the gospel, to re receive the stripes on his back, to spend the night in jail singing praises, and to slip out of town in the middle of the night to travel on secondary roads to Berea. How dangerous was that? That is how the world is turned upside down, upside down for Christ by being faithful to what God has called us to do. Well, in tonight's study, here's what I want you to look for. You're going to see God working in amazing ways once again. All right, and what we're going to see is how God sends Paul to take the gospel to a very, the, the very heart of an immoral culture. The lesson is that we go from Athens, which was the height of man's, uh, quote, wisdom and culture, to Corinth, which is the place of the depths of immorality. And the bottom line is people need the Lord. Well, do you ever think that Paul, as strong as he was in the Lord, could experience being afraid, perhaps even fearful for his life? Well, we're going to see the encouragement that Jesus brings to Paul to not be afraid when he was in Corinth. Jesus promises to be with him. And we're also tonight going to see how God uses people from all walks of life to spread the gospel. For an example, we're going to see the life of Paul, who is a, Tars a Jew from Tarsus and once described himself as the Pharisee of Pharisees. And then we go to Aquil and Priscilla, which is a married couple that was of great help to Paul and to the ministry. And then we're going to go see Apollos. And Apollos was a very eloquent Jew from the center of education, which would have been Alexandria. And he then had come to Ephesus as well. <clears throat> well, by, by the end of our study, we're going to ask ourselves this question. How can God use us in his amazing kingdom work as we study the life of the early church and what God did to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? Again, I'm very indebted to Dr. Stevens and his book. I'd highly recommend that book as a resource for you to study and learn more in depth about um, the, the journeys of Paul. Well, here we go. So <clears throat> in Acts 18, uh, Paul is going to leave Athens and he goes to Corinth where he encounters Aquila and Priscilla. And we see that in chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. It says, After these things that Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. So we're going to see here that Paul is now in Corinth and he is going to find Aquila and Priscilla and just see how God's timing of bringing them into Paul's life. So you might be asking yourself the question, well, wait a minute, where's, where's Silas and Timothy? I thought, I thought they were with Paul. And if you recall uh, that Paul, when he came to Athens and he was escorted there to Athens from the brethren at Berea, he told them to make sure, it says, that he gave them a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed. And so, if you recall, they had been, they had remained in Berea. Well, when you piece together not only what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, but also what we're going to see in, in verse 5 in just a minute, where uh, Silas and Timothy come to Paul there in Corinth, when you piece it all together, you realize that, that Silas and Timothy's movements between Paul's departure from Berea and their rejoining him in Corinth, it must be reconstructed in accordance with 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and it appears as instructed that they joined Paul in Athens 1 Thessalonians 3 1 from which Timothy was then sent back to Thessalonica and Silas also went back to Macedonia where exactly is not indicated but when Paul then went on from Athens to Corinth uh, in, in verse 1, which we just read, where he was rejoined by Silas and Timothy on their return from Macedonia. So that kind of pieces together where Silas and Timothy were and when they rejoined Paul. Well, if you go <coughs> there in uh, you see the Areopagus sermon. It's interesting to me that today the Athenians have made um, they have made a, made up for their ancestors' indifference to Paul. They've engraved the text of Paul's sermon there. Uh, I'll show you an arrow that is engraved upon a stone there in the Areopagus, and even there in Athens, there is a mural at the Athens Academy. 
And this is a picture or a painting of Paul teaching the Athenians. And uh, so they even have a thoroughfare named after Paul in Athens. Well, he goes on to Corinth, and I just want you to see there where Corinth is in relationship to Athens. And it is going to be about 50 miles away. And Corinth is going to be the focus point, focal point really of the second, second missionary journey. Paul's gonna spend 18 months there. Um, I was reading one commentary and it said, you know, when you think of the first missionary journey, you think of South Galatia. When you think of the second missionary journey, you think about Corinth and when you we're going to get to that eventually but when we go on the third missionary journey you think of Ephesus well if you ever get to go to Corinth there will be the sign that you see that is indicating where ancient Corinth is located so um, I want to talk a minute uh, just a minute about Corinth and what we can expect when we get there but <clears throat> I want to show you the location of where Corinth is, where the city of Corinth is. It's definitely a city that is defined by location. And as you can see there where it's located, that it is on an isthmus between Peloponnesian Greece and the mainland Greece. Geographically, it's the city of Corinth is known as the city of two seas. Uh, it was strategically located at the western end of the Isthmus of Corinth, thus controlling the trade routes between mainland Greece to the north and Peloponnesian Greece to the south. And as you can see it there, well, uh, Lechium, uh, that is going to be a port that is going to be on the western side. Now, you, it's not indicated there, but it's about a mile and a, and a half uh, northwest of Corinth, and that's going to be the port, port that would be on the western side that would put, give you access to the Ionian Sea, which eventually would give you access to the Adriatic Sea. And then you see um, Sincrea, which is going to be a port that is going to open up there into the Aegean Sea. It's actually a, a Saronic Gulf is where it goes to. This is going to be very important because, again, this city was defined by lo its location. Very interesting history for it. Well, <clears throat> as you see, down there at the very base of where this isthmus is located, where the end of this uh, mainland is Peloponnesia, you see how crag craggy and rough and rocky and there's just a little passageway for a ship to get around through there. Well, it is known as the Cape Malia and it is about a 200 mile trip. Well, it was so dangerous at this extreme southern tip of Greece that the journey was regarded that it was so dangerous that two famous Greek proverbs stated this, let him who sails around Malia forget his home. And another proverb was, let him who thinks of sailing around Malia make his will. That is how dangerous it was. <clears throat> so needless to say, they came up with a way in order to bring the cargo from these ships from one side of from the east over to the west to the west over to the east and this if you believe it this is a kind of quote the first railroad right here um and the name of it is diakos diakos and that is a road that you can see today and you can still see the ruts of where they would have transferred the cargo now the smaller vessels they were able actually um to uh to roll them across. It says the smaller vessels would actually be hauled over land at the narrowest part of the isthmus on a sort of railroad of wooden logs called a dialkos, about three and a half miles in length from one port to the other. And the cargoes of the larger vessels would likewise be carried across this distance on a paved road built in the sixth century BC and deposited on ships on the other side. Well, just to the north, as you as just as you see here, um, this is an, also another picture that I did want to show you. And also, they did end up cutting a canal through this isthmus. Uh, several great uh, world leaders tried. I, I think Alexander the Great might have tried. Um, Julius Caesar, um, but it, it, it was not done till many many years later. But today, you can go there and you can actually see the Corinthian Canal. As you can see, they cut right through there in order to transport the ships uh, across that isthmus so they didn't have to go around the southern tip. And that's a picture that Dr. Stevens has taken. Well, 
Um, just if you look at this picture, we're going to go on to Corinth now. Now, this is a major harbor road that would have run right through the heart of, of Corinth. And as you see in the background, just south of the city was called the Acre Corinth. Okay. And this is a steep, flat topped rock that's rising up about almost 1900 feet above the plain, on the top of which was the Temple of Aphrodite, which was the goddess of love, whose service gave rise to the city's proverbial immorality, which served the city as its citadel. Well, uh, just to expand on that just a little bit, um, it, it, after it was restored, and I'm going to cover that in just a minute, but uh, it, it came back to its former economic prosperity, and it was, uh, it, it was a known, had a reputation of unrestrained, unrestrained sexual license for which it gave the verb to the Greek language. And so uh, the first century historian Strabo claims that the temple owned a thousand prostitutes or temple slaves. Their immoral trade was not confined only to the top of the Acre Corinth, but they would come down into the city as well. And so the Greek term to act as a Corinthian was synonymous with fornication. Paul's, Paul addresses the sin of sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 5 and for, um, in chapter 6 and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, well, the history of Corinth, I just, I want, oh, I did want to show you some pictures. This is right up at the top of that flat-topped rock. Uh, some different um, remains that are still there that you can go and see today. This would be the Temple of Apollo. This is another angle of that same area. This is what the Corinthian ruins looks like. As you can see, you can still see many of the engravings upon what would have been uh, the tops of the, uh, the columns that would have been uh, supporting these temples. Uh, completely destroyed in many areas. This uh, it was actually, I'll show you another picture in just a minute, but this is the theater, which normally those are preserved pretty well, but not in Corinth. Um, and the, again, I wanted to show the inscription and the detail work of what this city was like. As a matter of fact, this is the Arch of Tiberius. Of course, you know Tiberius reigned from 14 to 37 AD, um, and he would have been the emperor at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And if you look real carefully, you can actually see his name imprinted and carved out in that stone. And just look at the detail work on those columns and the leaves that, that, um, that are there that are just such incredible detail work, which uh, this is 2,000 years later. Uh, and we're still able to look at that. The Odeon Theater, again, an Odeon Theater was a smaller theater than your, your massive theater that most cities uh, hosted or, or boasted about. And here's another angle of it as well. They're just smaller, more, more for smaller gatherings. And this is the picture of what the theater was, would have been, where it would have been, uh, but it is in complete ruins today. Well, Corinth, it's very interesting because it originally was a Greek state uh, whose name first appeared in Homer's Iliad. Now, it was destroyed by the Romans in 146. Now, if you, you know, 146 is the date that's given for where the transition went from the Greek world empire to where the Romans were now in uh, the, the control. They were known as the world dominant power was uh, 146 is when many historians uh, date that. Uh, so it was destroyed because basically <laughs> by way of reprisal for the leading role it played in the revolt of the Achaean lead against the overlordship of Rome. Basically Rome was becoming more and more powerful and they chose to be on the wrong side of the fight because they actually withstood Rome and then Rome completely leveled the city. All right. So um, then, in uh, it's actually the the uh, Roman general's name was um, Mummius, and he finally leveled the city to the ground. He slaughtered all the Greek males and sold Greek women and children into slavery. Corinth lay in destruction, uninhabited for a century, and this is what's so amazing. So for a hundred years, it was not rebuilt. Um, and the only thing that you could see was the little bit of a remains of the Temple of Apollo, but Julius Caesar recognized its strategic location, and in order not, not only to relax the overcrowding that was uh, happening in Rome in 44 BC, Julius Caesar established a Roman colony on the old site, and the city began to flourish again. Well, indeed it did, because this is how it ended up looking. 
it's a it's it was a very uh, recently built city if you if you if you can uh, realize that you know when Paul gets there so uh, no doubt uh, we're going to see that the the Jewish population uh, swelled in the first century AD no doubt due to the imperial edicts of AD 19 which would have been under Tiberius and then one we're going to mention today uh, well we did actually in uh, verse 2 where it says that Claudius commanded the Jews to depart from uh, Rome and we're going to see why he did that um, but no doubt this is one of the places that the Jews came to as is in the case of Aquila and Priscilla. Um, I did want to mention also that one important feature of the life in Corinth would have been the Ishmian Games, uh, second only to the Olympic Games in importance, and they were staged every other year under the city's sponsorship, and they were dedicated to the Poseidon God of the Sea. Now, living as long as Paul did there uh, in that area, he, it's very likely, and this is a part of the remains of where these games would have taken place, it's very likely that he attended some of the events of the Ishmian Games, seeing the games at Atlas as an evangelistic opportunity to spread the gospel of Christ, from which he drew many metaphors for the Christian life. Do you recall in, his, in the letters that he wrote, uh, for example, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about the boxer's uh, sparing, sparring habit. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, he also talks about the herald who, was, who would summon the runners to the starting line. Or how about Philippians 3, where he talks about the course along which the athletes pressed on toward their goal. Or how about 2 Timothy 4, where he says that the judge is awarding the prize at the end of the race. 1 Corinthians 9 again, the prize of the laurel crown for the victor. And then Philippians 4, the joy and the exaltation of the victor. Or 1 Timothy 4, the strict discipline of training under which the athletes place themselves. And or for 2 Timothy 2, the strict regulations which the athletes had to observe. There's many um, metaphors, there's many uh, parallels that he uses to parallel with the Christian life. Well, as we continue on, we see that the city soon regained its former importance. Oh my goodness, it was the emperor was building the city from ground up. And it began to, again, the location was so important, so it became its former importance and status. And it began to reassert itself as a commercial powerhouse by once again controlling the land and the sea trade. The commerce gave Corinth an unusually robust market economy, but also generated a, an atypical social structure of almost a middle class of artisans and merchants, almost unparalleled in the ancient city. Um, this is a, more of a simplified version of what it would have looked like. We looked at that road just a minute ago, and we're going to talk about the Bema in, uh, pretty soon. But um, business attracts people, so Oriental and Greek immigrants moved in, creating a social melting pot of multiple languages and religions. Corinth was named capital of the province of Achaia, Achaia in 27 BC, only 17 years after coming back from total destruction. Think about that. It was named the capital of this province. Um, so as we go on and we look at, uh, uh, continue on with our scriptures, we realize in verse two, it says that a Jew named Aquila, a Jew named Aquila born in Pontius who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, um, it was, this would have been just about, that's a picture of it, of how far they had to travel. We don't know their exact route, but that's very likely how they got there. And uh, the distance would have been almost uh, 760 miles. So as uh, they, the, um, the Christian, you'd say, well, how did Christianity get in Rome? Well, if you recall on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, it says there in Acts 2 that some of the visitors there were from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, it says. And so it's very likely that is how by AD 30, which is uh, where we're moving to it, it, in AD 30 at the time when of Christ, um, when it, his crucifixion on the gospel would have been taken back to Rome. So we see there on the day of Pentecost, it's very likely how the gospel got to Rome. Rome. Well, also some more pictures there. Uh, these are all taken from Dr. Stevens, uh, the Agora Collins uh, there near the East Profilon, which is a main entryway. 
Uh, now, when we talk about Paul and Aquila and Priscilla uh, sharing in tent making, well, this is the market area. And also the West Shops is, is a very well, you know, uh, as far as um, ruins go, it's pretty well preserved. Here's a beautiful picture of what it would have looked like. The West Shops with the Corinth in the background. Well, I wanted to expand a little bit on this statement that we see there in verse 2, where it says that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Now, we know that Paul had come to Corinth in approximately A.D. 50, probably in late summer or autumn. That is the time period we're talking about right now. Well, why would Claudius have commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome? Well, I do just want to show you quickly that Roman emperors, uh, Augustus, uh, with Octavian Augustus would have been at the time of Jesus' birth. Tiberius would have been the emperor at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And we see also then that Gaius Caligula, uh, 37 to 41, he ended up being assassinated. Well, then his uncle Claudius was the emperor uh, at the time period that we're talking about. And um, so we see now that he had ordered. Well, if you look back uh, on history, uh, and it is recorded by the Roman historian Dio Cassius, that actually Claudius kind of was on edge about the Jews from the very beginning of his uh, reign, because it says that even in AD 41, that the Jews had multiplied there in Rome to the point that their numbers made it difficult to expel them from the city without a riot. And so he did not directly banish them, and this would have been in AD 41, but forbade them to gather together in accordance with their ancestral way of life. Well, now here we are at AD 49, AD 50, and so the recent edict of Claudius, and this would have been AD 49, expelled the Jews from Rome. They were expelled, it's interesting, and this is coming from Suetonius, who would have lived in AD 69 to 122, but they were expelled due to synagogue disturbances related to, and he writes, Crestus, which is thought to be a misspelling by the Roman historian Suetonius of the Jewish word for Messiah, which in Greek would read Christos. This is probably a reference to disturbances in the Jewish synagogues over the preaching of Jesus as the Messiah. And we certainly have seen that with all of Paul's journeys, haven't we? And we're going to see that also uh, in Corinth as well, uh, the disturbances in the Jewish synagogues. Well, Bruce writes this. He says that the, although Christianity was indistinguishable from Judaism at the time of Claud in the time of Claudius, it was perfectly distinguishable by the time of when Suetonius wrote, which would have been in AD 120. And it was well known that it was founded by Christ. At any rate, our inference from Suetonius that the riots were due to the recent introduction of Christianity into the Jewish colony of Rome agrees well enough with our independent inference from the New Testament that Aquila and Priscilla were Christians before they came to Corinth. So, I do want to make the point also that historically when an imperial edict like that went forth, that when the emperor died, that edict did not necessarily, was not necessarily uh, rescinded, it just was no longer enforced. And we are going to see where Aquila and Priscilla do go back to Rome and it would the timing would be just uh, shortly after Claudius's death in AD 54. So that's just a side note as well. Okay, well, Paul is going to work uh, with Aquila and Priscilla, and for by occupa occupation, they were tent makers. Well, I, I want you to know, in Judaism, it was not considered uh, proper for a scribe or a rabbi to receive payment for his teaching, so many of them practiced a trade in addition to their study and the teaching of the law. Paul, as a matter of policy, earned his living in this way during his missionary career. As a matter of fact, I have two separate quotes from different uh, Jewish rabbis where they, they talk about that he who makes a profit from the crown of the Torah shall waste away. And uh, that was from Hillel. And also Gamaliel III com commented, uh, commended the study of the Torah in combination with some uh, secular occupation. And so both we see uh, history indicating that that is exactly how the uh, rabbis interpreted it. Well, 
Paul labored as he went from city to city. We see that, uh, it, that, and that is why it was so helpful when a church would send aid for his needs as he commends the Philippian church for doing this. It was such a help. Um, I wanted to give you one verse here, Acts 20, 34, and uh, he's talking to the Ephesian elders there and uh, later on his trip to Jerusalem, and he says, yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. Uh, two other verses, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, it says, he writes, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. A little further in, in 2 Thessalonians, written a few months later after 1 Thessalonians, he writes this, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Well, it says that by occupation they were tent making, tent makers. Well, tent making involved not only working with leather as the primary material uh, from which the tents were made, but it also gives evidence that Paul worked with various kinds of fabrics. Um, the work also included the making and the repair of a large range of leather and woven goods. So if you think about it, oh, there, there are the two verses in Thessalonians that I just quoted for you. Um, so these tents were needed for many of the travelers staying in the city and for the sailors who usually lived in tents while their boats were docked. One scholar suggests that since the Ishmian games were held in the spring of AD 51, the trio probably had plenty of demand for their products. Um, Bruce also makes the following observation, and I thought this was very insightful, but this trade was very closely connected with the principal product of Paul's native province, Cilicia. Remember that? Well, that's the, the, the a cloth of goat's hair was called Cilicium, and it was used for clothes and curtains and other fabrics designed to give protection. Interesting, perhaps Paul learned this trade while in his native province of Cilicia. Well, as we go on to the next uh, few verses, we see where Paul preaches, of course, in the synagogue at Corinth, persuading both Jews and Greeks that Jesus is the Christ. And we see there in verses four through six, where it says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, so there we see where Silas and Timothy are now joining him from Macedonia. Paul, it says, was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they had opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own head. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. We see that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, it says. Um, and uh, there is a, the, the frag, there's a synagogue that would have been in Corinth at that time of the Jews. There's a fragmentary door inscription, and it says the synagogue of the Hebrews, now in the Corinthian, Corinth Museum. The inartistic quality of the lettering suggests that the synagogue congregation was not wealthy enough to command the services of an expert engraver in stone. And you will see that here to where you can see that the engraving uh, was uh, inferior to most of the engravings that we have seen there in Corinth. And here's a little bit closer view. And that says Synagogue of the Hebrews. Also, we do have a capital as well. And as you see, that was a very common sign of a Jewish presence was the picture of the several branched menorah. All right. Well, we see that when Paul is going to later write to the Corinthians that, um, that he, he looks at how he's going to describe when he first came to them. And I want you to see that because, and again, this is going to have been written a few years later, a few years later, but he's describing when he came to them at this point in time right now. And look at what he says, For, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, I want you to think about where had he just come from. 
he had just come from Athens yes and he he uh knowing that that uh well it'll give you insight into what he later wrote uh in the corinthians as as we uh, record we're talking about just a minute ago well in the first chapter look at what paul says he says for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god for it is written i will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Now think about that. You know, did he have Athens in his mind when he was thinking about that? Because it was literally the very center of all of that. The disputer of this age. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. Remember, he told the Athenians, the, the, the God, you do not know him. The altar right there to the unknown God. The one thing you know is that you don't know God. The unknown God. It please, So it say, he's writing to them, he says, in the wisdom of God, that the world through wisdom, through man's wisdom, did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And, and we remember in Athens that, that several of them were saved. They believed Paul's message, God's message. The Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So that'll give you new insight when you read those words, what the historical background was when Paul was writing that. Okay, so as we go on, we know that uh, from 1 Corinthians 16, we know who it was that first believed there. Because uh, he writes later, he says, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus. That is, is that it is the first fruits of Achaia. And that they had devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So he's telling us there who were the first people to believe. And we also know who he baptized. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 he mentions this I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius uh, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name yes I also baptized the household of Stephanus besides I do not know whether I baptized any other and he's going to be writing to the Corinthians we're going to see that and there were divisions in Corinth uh, we're going to get to that in just a minute but um, he, that's uh, where he says he, he identifies. Now, we're going to see Crispus and Gaius in our narrative today as we read through this chapter. Okay, so in verse 5, it says Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Now, we had talked earlier about where they had gone. They had actually gone back to Macedonia from Athens, and now they, they've come to Corinth. So I want you to just look at the joy that Paul has because Timothy is going to give him a good report about the faith and the love of the brethren in Macedonia. And the, the joy that he has, and he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desire to see us and we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? He says, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sakes before God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So Paul is getting ready right now to write that letter and this is what he's writing. He's saying, Timothy has come and my heart is so overjoyed at what he is telling me about how your faith has gone out to not only to Macedonia, but in all of the region around. And so ah, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. So, so now that Timothy and Silas have come to Corinth, Paul is going to write 1 Thessalonians in response to Timothy's good report. Okay, so he's going to write Second Thessalonians a few months later. So that will give you the context. Now, for those of you in my class who have the handout, 
Oh, uh, there were those verses right there that I just I just uh, quoted to you. Um, so I'll just show them to you right there. I've already read them, but uh, for for I want you to see too that uh, you're going to be able to fill in the blanks on this chronology of Paul's life in just a minute. So that is another map showing you that he writes First and Second Thessalonians from Corinth after Timothy rejoins him there, bringing good news from Macedonia. All right. So the chronology of Paul's life. This is uh, this handout that I have for you. Uh, you are able now to fill in that uh, we're on the second missionary journey, and uh, he it was about 49 to 50 that Paul started the second missionary journey, and the time period is is AD 50, and Paul is going to write the epistles to the Thessalonians. Okay, and now he's going to stay in Corinth uh, from 50 to 52, so that's going to be about a, a, actually 18 months altogether. So you can fill those blanks in on your chronology uh, chart. Well, we're going to see where in verse 5 it says Paul devoted himself exclusively to the word. Well, the reason he was able to do that was because the church at Philippi, remember Philippi is in Macedonia, he, they had sent a monetary gift and there's where it's documented. And this may explain why he is able to devote himself full time to sharing the gospel. Uh, Paul is going to write about the gift that he received from the churches of Macedonia later when he writes to the Corinthians. Listen to how he describes this gift. He says, I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one for what I lacked. Look at this. The brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. Um, Paul also in 1 Corinthians 9 through through 10, he describes the support the church should give to those who preach the word. Uh, the gift from the Macedonia churches allowed him to preach the gospel full time. And in those verses, and you can uh, look them up later if you like, but it talks about where he says, whoever goes to war at his own expense and who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit and who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about, or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of that hope. Just indicating that the work of the ministry, it, it should be supported by the churches, and uh, that way they're able to give themselves to the attention of the word. Um, Marita is going to write these words. This passage illustrates the truth that the whole body of Christ is important in fulfilling the mission of the church. You may not be a skilled Bible teacher, but you can financially support the ministry of the Word. Then you're playing a vital role in making sure the gospel is shared. You may be so busy at home that you can't help out in the children's ministry, but if you are disciplining your own kids around the breakfast table, you are playing a vital role in spreading the gospel. It takes the whole body of Christ to get the gospel to the whole world. Now, you did notice that it says that he was preaching in the synagogues that Jesus is the Christ. And you remember our handout on that where I just went through the book of Acts showing Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Christ. So um, now in verse 6, we says, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, uh, we again, this is a pattern that we've seen many times that he goes to the synagogue. Now you remember, here's the documentation of the, all the synagogues that he's been in and the scripture verses where he's been at. Well, you see where we're at right now. We're down at the one that's Acts uh, 18, uh, 4 and 19 and 26, where it talks about where he now is in Corinth. Well, it says that, uh, a very interesting statement in verse 6, it says he shook off his garments. Now, this is similar action to announcing judgment as when he shook off the dust from his sandals. Remember that when he was at Antioch in Pisidia in Acts 13, we record this. You remember the instruction that Jesus gave to his own disciples when he sent them out two by two. And it says, in any place that they don't receive you uh, and they don't listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Well, when he says this statement, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. 
uh, most likely uh, he's saying that is that when he has he has fully declared to the Jews the good news of the gospel and the full counsel of God he is innocent their rejection of the Messiah is on their own heads and if you look uh, in Ezekiel you will find this passage and no doubt this is where Paul what Paul is alluding to is out of Ezekiel where it says in Ezekiel chapter 3 and and other places in Ezekiel well Ezekiel as well it says if I say to the wicked you shall surely die and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life that wicked, wicked person shall die for his iniquity but his blood I will require at your hand but if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his own wickedness or from his wicked way he shall die in his own iniquity but you have delivered your soul so uh, Paul on his way down when he's going to Jerusalem and this is going to be at the end we're going to get to this later but he is talking to the Ephesian elders and he says to them uh, that he is he wants to finish his race with joy and the ministry he has received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God and the grace of God and he's given a little bit of uh, history about his life and this is what he says and indeed now I know that you all among whom I have now gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more therefore he says I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God and so we see that connection to where he is saying I have declared to you the counsel of God and so therefore I am innocent of, blood, of your blood upon my head. All right, so in uh, verses 7 through 11, we're going to see where Paul stays at the home of justice who worshiped God. Paul remains in Corinth for 18 months, and we know because he is now excluded out of the synagogue. And we see that, that in verses 7 through 11 where it says, and he then departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose name, house, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So he didn't go very far, he just went right next door. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Wow. Think about that. Think about that. Well, if we look at Justice, verse 7, it says his house was next door to the synagogue. His threefold name is uh, is believed to be a reference to Gaius. Now, we, we saw that earlier. Um, and Titius Justice would be known. He's a God-fearer, and he's presumed to be a citizen of Roman Corinth. Well, that threefold name is constructed on the ide assumed identification of Titius Justice of Acts 18.7 here with Gaius of 1 Corinthians 1.14 and Romans 16.23. Well, <clears throat> we see in verse uh, 8 there that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. Now that's very similar to what we have seen. Uh, remember uh, Cornelius and Lydia and the Philippian jailer? All of them, it says that not only did they believe, but their whole household believed. And here's a chart showing these god fears and this, their significant role in Acts. We've seen that over and over again. Where, like in Caesarea, when Peter was sharing with Cornelius, or Philippi, where Paul's sharing with Lydia, or now in Corinth, and we see Titius Justice now as well. Um, and I, I want you to look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 1 14 through 16. It again mentions Gaius, and that's why it's believed that's who this is. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. And it says, um, and he talks about he also baptized the house of, household of Stephanus as well. And it says in verse 9 that many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Do you see that order there? That reminds you of what Paul wrote in Romans, that where it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, in verses 9 through 10, uh, Jesus comes to Paul in a vision. And it says, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, 
for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Now, you remember, we have a, a list also of the visions of Paul in, in just the book of Acts that we have seven of them recorded all together. So this would be the vision uh, here at Corinth where he, Paul, uh, where the Lord is encouraging him. And he says these words, do not be afraid. Now, according to the word meaning in the New Testament, the first two verbs are imperfect and the third is aorist. So the literal translation is stop being afraid, but go on speaking and do not become silent. It would seem that Paul had become fearful for his life he needed the divine assurance. And um, it reminds me of the words in uh, Jeremiah when, whenever uh, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah, he says, Behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes, against the priests, and against the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. It reminds us, doesn't it, of what the Lord said to Jeremiah um, in, in many, many years before 500 B.C. So Kent Hughes writes these words. He says, the vision in its opening words, the fact that God made the effort to encourage Paul not to fear, meant that God loved and cared for his ambassador. This assurance ministered to Paul's heart, just as 1 John 4, 18 teaches us, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The simple words in the vision filled Paul's heart with God's love, and fear was put to flight. Time and time again, uh, the scriptures tell us to fear not, because we are divinely loved, and God's love is enough. You know, I love the verse out of uh, Psalms 56. I have this highlighted in my Bible. Verses 3 through 4, it says, When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I will praise, in God I trust. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And then in verses 9 through 11 of that same chapter, uh, Psalms 56, it says, This I know, God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere humans do to me? But speak. Now, it's interesting because when Paul, remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we read that earlier, um, that it says that he reminded them that I did not come to you with excellence of speech. So I just want you to know that though Paul did not consider himself a good speaker, he was a speaker of good things and the gospel, and that's what we can be as well. So I just want to give you this possible scenario as we've looked at the times and the writing of Thessalonians, the letters to the Thessalonians, and the vision of Paul, I just want to uh, give you this possible scenario. Uh, this is just some of my thoughts. Um, okay, so we know that Paul had written to the Thessalonians two letters, and the, some of them were just a few weeks or a month apart. Okay, so we know if, if while he's at Corinth, he's going to write these two letters to the Thessalonians. Well, it's interesting because when you read in the book of the, the letters, it says that he asked them to pray for him, the, meaning the Thessalonians, to pray for him. And you remember when Paul initially wrote and told the Corinthians that when I came to you, I was in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Okay, so Paul writes these two letters to, Thess to the Thessalonians. And I want you to look at what he asked them to pray for him. This is what he wrote. He said, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run, run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. So he is asking the Thessalonians to pray for him this specific prayer. Is it possible that at this point that Paul has the vision of Jesus telling him not to be afraid to speak. My thought is this, is it possible that the vision given to Paul was in response to the church at Thessalonica praying for him the exact prayer he had requested? He asked them to pray for the word of the Lord to run swiftly and to be glorified. He asked them to pray that they should be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. And then you have what we hear, what the Lord Jesus saying to him in this vision, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you for I have many people in this city. Well, 
We see the Corinthian vision reassured Paul of God's divine protection. And it is true, no one did lay a hand on Paul after all of, all of his difficulties. You think about this, he was stoned in Lystra, he was beaten with rods uh, in Philippi, he was run out of town from Thessalonica and Berea, and here in Corinth, he will see the ruler of the synagogue, Sothenes, beaten, but Paul will be unharmed, Acts 18, 17. And um, so we, uh, go, going on, we see where Philippi, if you think about it, it, it you, you think about all these places where he's been and just the list that I gave you there of not only being beaten or stoned or running out of time, but Philippi would become one of Paul's most beloved churches, They're so generous to him and in both money and personnel throughout his ministry. We see them repeated over and over again, even to the end. Then you think about Thessalonica, it became Paul's most aggressively evangelistic church. I mean, you can read about that to where he says, you became followers of, of us and of the Lord, and you, re, you having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. He goes on and talks about that from you, meaning Thessalonica, that the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Well, think of, wow, what an evangelistic church Thessalonica was. Well, and then you think about Berea. Berea to this day celebrates Paul's Macedonia vision to this very day. And here in Corinth, in the very province of Achaia, it becomes one of Paul's most dynamically gifted churches, spiritually eclipsing by far, in a way, its personal rival in Athens. Wow. And it, I, I wanted to clarify, too, this statement. He says, for I have many people in this city. Thus, uh, either many Corinthian believers already are in the city to be gathered and taught, or Paul will have many converts. That's what he believes that is uh, meant there. And so he's going to stay there a year and six months. He's going to teach the Word of God. And we again, we see the similarities uh, to the Great Commission. Jesus tells him to speak. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, commanding them to, to can keep all the things that I've commanded you, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see that? Okay, so now we're going to go to verses 12 through 17. And now the Jews with one accord rise up against Paul and brought him before Galileo, the Roman proconsul of Achaia. So in verses 12 through 17, we read these words. It says, now when Galileo uh, was proconsul of Achaia, it says the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then it says all the Greeks took Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. Okay, wow. Well, Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, and it says the dating of Galileo's proconsulship is vital to the chronological dating of Paul's missionary journeys. I'm amazed at how God just uh, just so gives pieces of information so that we are able to to correctly uh, chronologically date things uh, you're going to be amazed at this discovery that they made um okay but first of all he was pro council from july very specifically july 8051 to 8052 okay now of course a pro council means that you're second to the emperor this is how powerful he was and uh, so uh, he would have had Claudius, I mean, he, he it directly in, reports to Claudius. That, that's how close he was to the emperor. Well, Bruce writes these words. He says, probably less than a year after Paul arrived in Corinth, a new proconsul of Achaia took up his official residence in the city. Lucius Junius Galileo was the son of the elder Seneca and brother of Seneca the philosopher. And there are those dates there. 
um, who was the Rome's leading intellectual tutor. He was also the tutor to Nero before Nero turned on him. And I wanna give you a picture here of Seneca the Elder, and then you have Seneca the Younger, and Galileo would have been his brother, all right? So again, you see the dates there as well. Well, as we go on, we see that he was born in Condova and came to Rome with his father in the reign of Tiberius. Now, in Rome, he was adopted by his father's friend, the rhetorician L. Junius Galileo, and assumed his adoptive father's name. His brother Seneca, Seneca, and he's very well known uh, in Roman history, uh, it says, praises his virtuous and lovable character. No mortal is so agreeable to any one person as this man is to everybody. So that's a little bit of a commentary on uh, what Gal Galileo was like. And it says, the date of his entry upon the proconsulship of Achaia can be dated by the aid of an inscription of Delphi, July the 1st, AD 51. He did not remain in this office very long, for ill health ob obliged him to relinquish it. Well, let me show you a little bit about this Delphi inscription, because uh, it's also called the Galileo inscription, and it's the name given to a collection of nine fragments of a letter written by Roman Emperor Claudius in approximately uh, AD 52, which was discovered early in the 20th century at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. Greece. Well, let me show you this, okay? So uh, when Stevens writes this, he says the Galileo inscription provides a, a concrete date for Paul's appearance before the proconsul in Corinth. Well, here's where Delphi was, all right? It's where the, uh, the red star is. Here is where Corinth is, okay? So that's about 122 miles. Well, it was at this temple site in Delphi, Greece, that they found this inscription, all right? Now, that's the remains of this would be in the temple uh, to Apollo, okay? Well, this is what it looks like. This is what they found, and they began to read it. Well, let me show you where Gal Galileo's name is. It's right there. It's underlined, all right? So that is just so neat to me because uh, that, that it's very specifically gives the date of when Galileo would have been the proconsul there in Corinth. Okay, um, so uh, in verses 14, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 12, let's go move, look at verse 12 first. It says, they brought him to the, the bema or the judgment seat. Now, the judgment seat or the bema was a large raised stone platform in the marketplace, and it was situated in front of the proconsul so he could easily judge the cases. Well, again, if you look at that map of Corinth, I have a red circle of around where the bema, bema seat would have been located. Um, this is an inscription that you will see there, a plaque that if you get to go there, that's what you're going to get to see. That is it in proportion to the Corinthian Bema. All right, and this is uh, several pictures of it. As you can see, this is where Paul would have been taken. All right, that's what it looks like. Well, it says in verse 13 that his fellow uh, persuades men, uh, men to worship God contrary to the law. This is what they accused him, okay? Once again, you see social disruption from Christian preaching that Luke shows it to be synagogue-inspired and not native to the Christian message, all right? And he says, he continues on, this charge, as reported by Luke, is ambiguous. Which law, Jewish or Roman, was Paul accused of breaking? On the whole, it is more likely that he was accused of breaking Roman law. Their hope lay in convincing him that Paul's activity constituted a, a contravention of Roman law, which it was Galileo's business to maintain. All right, so we see now, um, as we read on, it says that Paul, that is to say, was charged with propagating an illegal religion. The implication was that what he was preaching was certainly not Judaism, which Judaism, I don't, historically, it enjoyed the recognition and the protection of the imperial law uh, because it was considered an, an, an ancient religion, basically. It was protected under Roman law. So the imperial law, except when its practice of, or propagation endangered uh, the public order. So uh, the Romans were very um, gracious with the Jews as far as Judaism goes, and uh, they gave them special... Um, 
exclusion from persecution under the law. And initially, Christianity was considered to be just within Judaism. And as we see, as time passes, of course, there was that uh, complete division between the two because the Christians, of course, proclaimed that Jesus Christ, Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Christ. And the Jews uh, in the synagogues did not believe that. So the split came. All right. So... As we go on, uh, we read these verses again, and where it says, he, before he even opened his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it's a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, uh, there would be reason why I would bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names of your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be the judge of such matters. And it says he drove them out uh, from the judgment seat. And so if you think about it, he summed up the situation really quickly. And to him, Paul was, was a Jew, like his accusers, and spoke the same sort of language as they did. If there were differences between Paul and them, these differences concerned interpretation of Jewish law and religion, and it was no part of Galileo's responsibility to pronounce judgment, he says, or questions like these. If public order was being endangered, or if a crime or mis misdemeanor had been involved, then Galileo would certainly have taken the matter up. But it seemed clear to him that although Paul's accusers tried to represent the apostle as offending against Roman law, the matter at issue was one of Jewish law. Accordingly, he had them ejected from the court and turned a blind eye when the ruler of the synagogue was mobbed by the bystanders. And, bystanders. and we see that in verse 17 where it says, Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, this is possibly the same Sothenes that Paul was with Paul when he wrote 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 2. It says, uh, 1 Corinthians, very very first verses, it says, Paul called to me an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother. Now, now uh, either Crispus, uh, as you noticed earlier, Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. So uh, either Sothenes followed Crispus or uh, it's, it's possible also as well that um, there, the synagogue may have had multiple rulers as well. And he may have had already been in that position along with Crispus. But in Anyway, he's identified as the ruler of the synagogue here. Now, I want you to notice the importance. Um, oh, I did want to show you that verse as well, where it says, Paul called to me an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God, uh, which is in Corinth. Uh, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Um, it says, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Well, you really cannot underestimate the importance of this ruling, Galileo's ruling. Had Galileo ruled in favor of the Jews, then Christianity would have been outlawed throughout the Roman Empire. Now, Sir William Ramsey writes this. He says he regarded Galileo's ruling as a crowning precedent for Paul's evangelistic uh, activity. It provided a precedent for other magistrates and thus guaranteed Paul's freedom to prosecute his apostolic mission with the assurance of the benevolent neutrality of the imperial authorities for several years to come. The mere fact that Galileo refused to take up the case against Paul may reasonably be held to have facilitated the spread of Christianity during the last years of Claudius and the earlier years of his successor, which would have been Nero. Wow. All right. Well, we go on now. We're traveling on. We're going to go to verses 18 through 22, and we're going to see that Paul returns back to Jerusalem to fulfill a vow. Aquil and Priscilla are going to accompany him to Ephesus, and then Paul goes down to Antioch, and the second missionary journey will come to an end. Okay? So in verses 18 through 22, it says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he had his hair cut in Sincria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them, speaking of Aquila and Priscilla there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now when they asked him to stay a little longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast uh, in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. 
well, Priscilla and Aquila are with him. Uh, Paul leaves Corinth and crosses the Aegean where he stops in Ephesus. Now, this is interesting because if you remember, that's the very capital of the Asian province. Remember on the second missionary journey where the Holy Spirit did forbade him to go that direction? Well, all in God's timing, this was the very heart of Asia, which is where he wanted to go earlier. There, they will be there when he comes back on his third missionary journey. Aquila and Priscilla will be there in Ephesus when he comes back. And he on a third missionary journey, he's going to make a beeline for Ephesus. All right, just interesting, all in God's timing. Well, again, I want you to see the path that they would have taken. They would have left Corinth and they would have been in Ephesus. Well, I just want to focus just a minute on Aquila and Priscilla. The, this is an amazing couple, just an amazing couple. Just some of the things that pe piecing together uh, different passages out of either Corinthians or the Acts or Romans, we see several things about them. One is they evidently held the church meeting in their home there in Ephesus because he talks about that um, in, in the, um, the 1 Corinthians 16, 19 when he's writing to the Corinthians and he talks about the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Okay, <clears throat> then they're going to instruct Paul, Apollos when he gets there. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Well, not only that, but they then, Priscilla and Aquila, would eventually return to Rome as referenced by Paul when he wrote his letter to the Romans. Listen to how he described them. He said, greet. He t he's, tell he's writing to the people, the believers at Rome, and he tells them to greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. It says, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So they not only uh, house the church in Ephesus, we see evidence that they house the church in Rome as well. And then he goes on and he gives, uh, he says, greet my beloved, uh, Ep a, it's pronounced Epanitus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. And so anyway, uh, another thing we see there is the couple would later be back in Ephesus because in Paul's last letter, he refers to them in 2 Timothy, where it says that um, he says, greet Prisca, and he uses her more form formal name, and Aquila, and the household of Onesiphorus. All right. So in verse 18, it says that he had his hair cut off in Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. Well, you, you know where Sincrea is. You see it there just right below Corinth there, and it would have been the eastern port from which they would have sailed from the, um, the, from the southern end there of Greece. All right. And so he had taken a vow. Well, John MacArthur writes this, this vow was probably a private vow, such as was often assumed by the Jews in consequence of some mercy received or of some deliverance from danger. Uh, it, is, uh, it was a Nazarite, if it was a Nazarite vow, then he would need to present the shorn hair at the temple within 30 days. So that may explain why he left with such haste. And it's interesting because Bruce makes the notation that accordingly the seas were open for navigation in the early spring of 52, then when he would have left Corinth with Aquila and Priscilla. And before embarking at Sincrea, the eastern port of Corinth, he cut his hair, which he allowed to grow long for the duration of that vow, okay? And so the cutting of the hair, it could have been a temporary Nazarite vow for which he had undertaken. And, uh, was in, and so he then would finish this vow by being at the temple. Well, you might be asking, well, wait, I thought Paul had argued for the truth that the Gentiles didn't need to be circumcised or adhere to the Mosaic law in order to be saved. Why is he observing a Jewish ritual? Why is he going to Jerusalem to keep a feast? Well, Marita, quoting John Stott, says this. He says, once Paul had been liberated from the attempt to be justified by the law, his conscience was free to take part in practices which, being ceremonial or cultural, belong to the matters indifferent. Perhaps on this occasion, in order to conciliate the Jewish Christian leaders, he was going to go see in Jerusalem. So he comes to Ephesus, and it says that he leaves Aquila and Priscilla there. Now remember, Ephesus is at the very heart of Asia, and I just uh, want to have a circle there that I want to show you. Remember, he's there at Ephesus, so that is where uh, he's going to leave Aquila and Priscilla. Now, it's, uh, they asked him in the synagogue to stay a little bit longer, and he did not consent, but he took leave of them. The Western text of Acts 18.21 makes, uh, makes Paul say, 
I must by all means keep the coming feast at Jerusalem. Now, since Passover fell at the beginning of April in AD 52, and navigation did not begin until about the 10th of March, this could explain Paul's haste. Very insightful for that. Um, <clears throat> And Paul says, uh, God willing, I will return to you. So he promises to come back to God willing to the synagogue there in Ephesus. All right. In, in verse 22, he lands at, uh, in the port of Caesarea, and then he goes up to greet the church at Jerusalem. So the date is AD 52, and this is referenced to as Paul's fourth quick post-conversion visit to Jerusalem. Well, now, as we finish out this chapter, we see in verses 23 through 28 that Paul is going to begin his third missionary journey. We're just going to read one verse, but you can uh, notate that in your Bible that this is where that's going to begin. Also, we're going to have the story of Apollos where he comes to Corinth and how Aquila and Priscilla then instruct him more accurately, it says, in the way of God. So in verses 23, it says, uh, talking about Paul, it says, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. You know, that's what Paul loved to do. Uh, he, that's why the second missionary journey was started. He says he wanted to go back through this region and strengthen the disciples. Well, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. But for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures, here it is, that Jesus is the Christ. Okay? Well, he spent, after spending some time at Antioch, he set out on his travels again. An impression of haste is given by the succession of participles in the Greek text of verse 22 and 23. In fact, a journey of about 1,500 miles is covered in these two verses and in uh, the first verse of chapter 19. So just to give you a picture here of where it says that Paul is now going to go out. Timothy is probably the one with him. Silas has probably remained back at Jerusalem. Remember, uh, Silas was a Jew from Jerusalem, we, and he joined Paul after the uh, Acts 15, after the Jerusalem Council. He traveled up to Antioch uh, from Jerusalem. So most likely that is where Silas remained, was in Jerusalem. And now Paul is leaving from Antioch, and uh, Timothy, no doubt, is with him. Uh, now this third uh, missionary journey uh, is going to start, and it's going to cover these uh, verses uh, in the book of Acts 18.23 to Acts 21.15. So uh, if you have your handout, uh, you can now go ahead and fill in that between uh, AD uh, 52 to 55, that's going to be Paul's third missionary journey, okay? All right, well, he is now going to depart and uh, it says that he's going to go over the region of uh, Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So I want you to see where uh, it says um, Galatia is, and also you see where Phrygia is as well. Well, in verses 24 through 26, we see where a certain Jew by the name of Apollos then is going to come to Ephesus. Now, I do want to mention too, uh, before I move on, is that probably when Paul traveled through that region, he was also encouraging them to take up a collection. Um, and he then well, that's going to be brought out. You'll see that in the scriptures that he is instructing the South Galatian churches to gather a contribution together for the aid of the poor in Jerusalem. And we're going to pick up on that later in some of his letters that he's writing. So it's, look at all the different things. Now, I want you to see where he's from. Okay, so Apollos is coming from from Alexandria and he came to Ephesus. Alexandria was an intellectual city of the Roman Empire located on the northern coast of Egypt. 
Well, what do we learn about Apollos? Well, from these verses, we see that he's born in Alexandria. He's an eloquent man. He's mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus, we find out, and he was instructed in the way of the Lord. Okay, he is fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. He knew only the baptism of John, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Well, Aquila and Priscilla heard him, and they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, look at God's divine plan and timing that Aquila and Priscilla would be there in order to instruct him. I, I just want you to think about this, how, how well-versed they were in their knowledge because they had spent a year and six months with Paul in Corinth. Now Paul is gone, and they are able to carry on and instruct others accurately. I just want to make this side note here um, that Aquila and Priscilla learned from Paul during their 18 months in Corinth. So we need to take advantage of the teaching at Kingsville Baptist Church and treasure what we are hearing and what we are learning. Uh, one of the ways that I do this, uh, whether I'm listening to Pastor Bart on Sunday morning or uh, Pastor Steve Mears on Wednesday night, um, that, uh, that by taking notes, I will write down and say, go through the scriptures. I find that to be very helpful. But when I get home, then I will take those notes and then I will rewrite them out. And I will take the passage of scripture. And um, I'm not saying I do this every time, but most generally I do. And I follow what it is that they have taught us from the, those scriptures. And then I'll file it file it in a in a binder some under that's all cat I have a binder that has every book of the Bible so under that particular book of the Bible I will file that lesson and so therefore I have been able to the best of my ability to capture that teaching of what I have learned and uh, not just uh, be a forgetful hearer but uh, hopefully a doer of the work and I just want to uh, bring this out I don't know if you're aware of how even secret church uh, we just I think we had the 19th one, uh, it was hosted also, uh, our church tied into it um, probably about a month ago or a couple weeks ago uh, about God, government, and the gospel. But I don't know if you know how that even began. <clears throat> but um, he, David Platt basically had gone on a mission trip, he talks about, and that he had gone to visit some persecuted brothers and sisters in order to share the gospel. And he said, I, I met with them, and they were part of an underground church in that area. And so we had come to this area, this part of the country, and to share the gospel in different places. But then at the end of one of the meetings, he said a brother or sister in Christ, and sister in Christ in particular invited me to meet with their church in, the, in an underground church in a secret location. And so he says um, they would meet together in secret in this part of the world because if they're caught, they could lose their houses or their jobs or their lands, and they could be put into prison, and they could eventually lose their lives. So I gathered together with them for a Bible study one afternoon, and he said it, it just kept going. He says they were so hungry for the word. He says, and so I thought we would have our an hour Bible study together, but Eight hours later, he said, we were still going strong and it was getting late at night. And so they said, hey, can we do this again tomorrow? And he said, okay, what time? And they said, why don't we get together in the morning? So I thought, okay, we'll have a morning Bible study. And they said, no, we will start in the morning and we will go until late at night. And that started a process. He said that over the next two weeks, for about eight to 12 hours a day, we would gather together in these secret places, secret locations, just diving into the word. He said, we walked really through all the books of the Old Testament and the New Testament because they wanted an overview of the whole Bible. So that, it, it, so that is what we did, just hours after hours, day after day. And I just saw a group of people who were passionate, he says, about God, passionate about his word, willing to risk their lives, their jobs, their land, whatever, just in order to study and know the word of God. Well, he says that he saw that hunger up for God's word and their hunger for God in prayer. And he described how they would gather together in a room and there would just be a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling because again, it was in a, in a dark place and they wanted to be protected um, and, and to be able to study. And so it says that the first night that everybody is just sitting there and he's just noticing how everybody is just like writing frantically. And, and he said to, to some of his companions afterwards, he said, 
wow, I was just amazed at how they were taking so many notes. And they are just really just so studying the Word of God. And he said, and his companions from that area said, well, yes, they, they're taking notes in order to learn, but they're also taking the notes so that they're able to share with others what they have just learned. And they want to accurately do it. And that is just so moving, um, you know, that people are in a room with a single light bulb and they're writing and they're listening because they have the intention of taking what they've learned to tell somebody else. I'll give you a picture. This is what a believer in North Korea, this is how he studies his Bible. So, you know, Aquila and Priscilla, they were ready to teach Apollos because they had been trained and they understood the way of God accurately. And so we too must cherish what we have in our church and um, in, in the resources that we have available to us to learn and know the Word of God so that we can share it with other people accurately. Well, we see that what this teaches us is that they were ready to teach Apollos, that they responded when they heard him sharing the gospel. Uh, they didn't just sit back and say, well, I'm not going to say anything. Oh, no. Oh, no. They responded, and they instructed him privately, and they explained the way of God more accurately. And I want you to notice that wording there, that everything is based upon the revelation of God. We've talked about that earlier, but it says they taught the way of God. It, you know, it wasn't the way of Paul, or it wasn't our own ideas. It was God's way that they taught. That is exactly what the gospel is. Paul is teaching in the gospel that that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he rose again, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And, and, they, they, and of course, the, the Christian, Christians were known as the way. That is uh, what Christianity was known as. So Apollos, he combined a great knowledge of the scriptures with a masterly skill in expounding their messianic content. And, content, and this was coupled with spiritual fervor. Now, an expression which uh, probably denoted not so much an enthusiastic temperament as a possession by the Spirit of God which is what it means when used by Paul in Romans 12, 1 about being fervent in spirit. Uh, Martin Luther actually suggested that Apollos was the writer to the, of the book of Hebrews. Uh, often we refer to the author of Hebrews as how we, because no one knows exactly who wrote Hebrews, and uh, Martin Luther suggested that it was actually Apollos. Well, it, he then decided he, he wanted, he desired to cross uh, to Achaia. The brethren wrote and they exhorted the brethren to receive him. So he wants to go over to Corinth. Let me show you that with the arrow. So he's going to, he wants to go from Ephesus over to Corinth. And so they wrote letters there uh, to go with him and to recommend him. Um, and so uh, the Western text also gives us a little bit of insight that it's, uh, they say that there were actually Corinthian believers who had come to Ephesus and they heard Apollos and they wanted him to come over there with them. And uh, so that's a, a, perhaps a historical um, indication of how he uh, went to Corinth and why. Uh, verses 27 through 28, he greatly helped those who believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures, here it is, that Jesus is the Christ. So uh, I want you to know that, that gospel the gospel message, I don't care what city you're in, I don't care who you are, it is the same. It is the same message, Jesus is the Christ. So we also learn from uh, Corinthians, when we talk about Corinthians, that Apollos, he was so effective in Corinth that people began to divide into camps of Peter, Paul, Apollos, and Jesus. And, and, uh, and um, Paul is later going to write to the Corinthians, and he's going to say that he had gotten word from uh, people in Chloe's household that there were contentions among them. For some were saying, I'm of a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas and Peter, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I think, my God, that's where he says, I baptized none of you except Crispus or Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. 
Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, he says, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, but lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. But there is no evidence whatsoever of personal rivalry or tension between Paul and Apollos. When he mentions Apollos in his letter to the Corinthians, he does so in terms which betoke friendship and mutual uh, confidence. He, he said these words <clears throat> in writing Corinthians, I planted Apollos water, but water but God gave the increase. And uh, when he writes to the Corinthians, uh, he is going to mention as well, and he also mentions uh, Apollos in Titus as well, referring to him as a, a fellow brother, uh, our brother Apollos. And um, so this is just a reminder that God has made each of us in all of our different giftedness and weaknesses uh, to be used for the kingdom purposes of sharing the gospel. If you recall, you remember how Paul had said that, uh, it was said of Paul that his uh, letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And Paul has said that as well. He says, even though I'm untrained in speech, yet I'm not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. And, and then you have Apollos, who's very eloquent, and regardless of, of whatever the giftedness is, um, the, it is to be used for the kingdom purpose in sharing the gospel. So we ask ourselves a question as we close our, out our lesson, why is this important? How have we seen God working in all of these amazing ways? Well, we've seen him working through the Apostle Paul. God takes the gospel to the very heart of an immoral culture. The, he goes from, the lesson is from Athens, which was the height of man's wisdom and culture, to Corinth the place of the depths of immorality. The bottom line is this, people need the Lord. Also, we saw how Jesus knows when we're afraid uh, to speak. He sends his word to give us strength for the tax, task that he has called us to do. I want you to see that God uses people from all walks of life. Think of all the people that we have been uh, seen in this lesson today. We, we have seen how God divinely ordered Paul's path to Corinth and there he meets Aquila and Priscilla, right? And they have a lifelong fellowship of ministry. Well, Justice is going to open up his, his home to Paul. And then Crispus and Sosthenes, the rulers of the synagogues, came to faith and were willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. We're going to see that God used Aquila and Priscilla to explain the way of God fully more ac and accurately to Apollos. And then we're going to see Apollos go over to Corinth and preach the gospel. So you just see this network of believers and how God uses each and every one to for his purposes and his plans. So let's ask ourselves the question, ourselves the question as we leave this area of Corinth. So now what? How can what are we going to do with what we have learned today as we have studied these scriptures? How can God use us? And I just want to ask you a few questions. Do we realize that the gospel is for all cultures, from places where elite philosophers spend all day talking about the meaning of life, to places like Corinth, where immorality was renowned in the ancient world? People, all people, need the Lord. Whenever you're afraid to speak the gospel, remember that Jesus is with you. He can, you can read his promises to you in the Bible. And he says, speak and do not keep silent. There are many who need to hear the gospel. I want you to think about this too. Remember the Macedonian churches and how they sent money with Silas and Timothy to bring to Paul? Well, think about what a help that was to Paul so that he is able to devote himself daily to teaching in that school there in Corinth for 18 months. Well, he, it's because of this financial support that they sent to him. So are there missionaries we can help financially? What a blessing the churches in Macedonia were to Paul when they sent their support. Well, think about Aquila and Priscilla with me for just a minute, okay? How they were always hospitable, regardless of where they went, whether it's corn, Ephesus, or Rome. I'll back up just, for just a minute. But think about this, that they, they uh, helped their fellow, they were called fellow workers, they risked their necks for Paul, they were willing to move to whatever, wherever they could. We see them in, in uh, Corinth, and we see them in Ephesus, and we see them back at Rome after the, yeah, Claudius had passed away, and then we see them back in Ephesus. 
they were obviously very mobile and willing to do whatever they needed to do to minister to the church. And then we see them ready and willing and equipped to, to teach Apollos, this, this Alexandria Jew in Ephesus, to teach him more accurately the way of God. And think of all the people that Apollos went on to impact. Regardless of our giftedness, are we willing and ready to be instructed by mature and wise believers? Think about that. As gifted as Apollos was, he was teachable. He listened to Aquila and Priscilla and taught boldly that Jesus is the Christ. And, and finally, here's what's so amazing. They all work together for one purpose of spreading the gospel and using whatever resources they had to that end. Everyone, whether we're talking about Pilate, Paul, or Silas, or Timothy, or the Macedonian churches, or Justice, or Aquila, Priscilla, Crispus, Sophonies, or Apollos, and not only them, but you and me as well. Father, we thank you for this study. We thank you for what we have learned today, God, how you just amazingly orchestrated all of these people and the paths that, that they crossed one another's paths. And, and God, they were able to, to edify one another and exhort one another and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I just praise you. I give you glory. And Father, we want to be just like the word says that when Jesus says, do not be afraid afraid to speak for I am with you. Lord, we pray that right now that we will not be afraid to speak, but we will be bold in the spirit and fervent in the spirit to share the gospel. And I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus, the Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Okay, everybody, we will see you next week.